Great. So thank you. Uh, thank you, Christian and Angela for inviting us uh, to speak today. Um, we think the Chicago Graphic Design Club is such a great forum for designers and those interested in design to share and connect. And uh, thank you everyone for joining us uh, this evening. So we are The Narrative. Uh, we're a communication design firm in Chicago's Ravenwood's, uh, Ravenswood um, neighborhood. Uh, our studio is located right next to the world famous Spockadopoly Pizzeria, which arguably the best part of COVID is that they now do takeout, um, which we made way too much of here. <laughs> Um, our backgrounds are quite different. I was born in Kharkov, Ukraine, and uh, lived in the Soviet Union uh, before immigrating to the U.S. and lived in a number of cities, uh, including uh, Baltimore, where I studied at MICA before making my way to Chicago. And I was uh, born outside of Philadelphia in a town called Norristown, PA. Uh, I then moved to Kansas for some reason when I was three years old. Um, and then when I was four, I moved back to the East Coast uh, to grow up in Connecticut. And then I moved to Boston to attend Northeastern University, where I uh, received my undergraduate degree. Uh, I remained in Boston for 11 years before I moved to Chicago to go to University of Illinois at Chicago for graduate school. Uh, I grew up in a family of artists and designers, always collaborating on and discussing the latest uh, painting, theater set, or design work. And I grew up in an alarmingly uncreative uh, household of uh, my father is a chemist, retired chemist, and my mother is a retired nurse. Um, I share a birthplace with Cassandre, a favorite uh, painter, commercial poster artist, and typeface designer of mine. And I share a birthplace with uh, baseball Hall of Fame manager, Tommy Lasorda, who is now making spaghetti sauce. Um, but despite our diverse backgrounds, uh, we both moved to Chicago to pursue design, um, just as Mies van der Rohe did almost a thousand years, a uh, hundred years ago, a thousand years ago, a uh, hundred years ago. Um, and I believe this is a testament to the city of Chicago where people from anywhere in the world can come and contribute um, to design and to our culture as a whole. Um, so a little bit about how we got involved uh, with this project. It was through a recommendation and we actually received an email in our inbox one day requesting we submit a proposal uh, for an RFP um, issued by something called 90910. Um, the email address um, had a lot of numbers on it. And at first we thought it could be a bot of some sort like the bots you see on Twitter with a bunch of numbers in the name. Uh, luckily upon closer inspection, we realized this was an incredible potential opportunity to rebrand the Mies van der Rohe building. Um, our proposal centered on a research-based approach, uh, which we'll share with you today. Uh, we felt this was an ideal fit for us being students and also educators of modernism and understanding the cultural and historical significance of the buildings. Um, we were thrilled and humbled to be entrusted with this unique project. Uh, we collaborated very closely with the president of the 9910 board, Trinidad Logue, and the architecture committee pictured here, Don Curtis, Timothy Kent, and Dave Pickert. Uh, their dedication and love for the buildings really made all of our work possible. Um, and here we are at the final brand presentation at the Arts Club, um, and we actually found in our research that uh, the building of the buildings were announced there. So we thought it would be nice to carry on uh, this tradition. Um, we'd like to start by providing uh, a little bit of context about 90910 and the building's architect, uh, Mies van der Rohe. Uh, 90910 are located in the Streeterville neighborhood in Chicago, um, seen here highlighted in red. Um, they're right on the lake uh, with access to beaches and jogging and bike paths along Lakeshore Drive really a beautiful spot. Um, they're a short walking distance from many of the cultural, historic, and commercial treasures like the Hancock Building, Museum of Contemporary Art, Newberry Library, and just a few blocks from the Magnificent Mile. Um, they stand next to their predecessors, 86880, uh, built by Nice just five years earlier. Um, 86880 Lakeshore Drive are also a pair of twin um, glass and steel apartment towers. Um, they're on the National Register of Historic Places, and um, more recently, they were also designated as Chicago landmarks. Here we see Mies, uh, dapper as ever, on a rooftop with 86880 as his backdrop. Uh, what's really incredible 
is that the design principles he first expressed in the Frederikstrasse skyscraper project in 1921, uh, pictured to the left here, uh, were finally able to be realized in 868-80 and 900-910 in, of all places, mid-century Chicago. Um, but what brought Mies to America uh, from his native Germany, um, starting in the early 30s, um, Ms. Mies served as the last director of the faltering Bauhaus, uh, which was forced to move from Dassau to, the abandoned, to an abandoned uh, telephone factory in Berlin. And in 33, it was raided by the Gestapo. And in July, Mies and the faculty voted to close it. Um, as an architect, he also built very little in these years. Uh, the Nazis uh, rejected his style as not German in character. Um, so he was frustrated and unhappy and reluctantly left his homeland. Um, but why uh, Chicago? Um, Harvard was calling as well. Uh, there's a famous letter. Mies wrote a friend asking, what do you think? You know, should I go to Harvard uh, in Boston or what about Chicago? And uh, he received a lengthy reply telling him that Chicago was much better uh, because it's more open-minded. Uh, Boston's a very traditional town. And after the Chicago fire, Chicago actually developed a really innovative way of thinking that would be a perfect fit for him. Um, as you can see in these photos here, um, there's also more opportunity to build in Chicago. It was much more of a grid-like open landscape and he could uh, design the whole campus at IIT, um, which, uh, you know, in Boston, um, you know, a lot of the soil was rock and landfill. And of course, Harvard had already, already been uh, designed largely. Um, here you, we can see uh, Mises a master plan for IIT. Um, he of course accepted the offer to head the Department of Architecture uh, where he introduced a new kind of education and attitude uh, which was later became known as the second Chicago School, which uh, became, as everyone knows, very influential um, in the following decades, particularly in uh, North America and Europe. Um, we could uh, talk about all the fascinating things that we learned about Mies all evening, um, but we'll leave you with a highly recommended book um, called Mies van der Rohe, Critical Biography, uh, the new and revised edition by Franz Schultz and Edward Windhorst. Um, it's very comprehensive and very insightful if you're interested in learning more. Um, before we uh, began any design work, uh, we followed a very thorough research process. And uh, the first thing that we did um, is that we conducted uh, interviews. Um, it was really important that we speak with a wide range of people who could enlighten us and share their perspectives and insights about 90910. Uh, the buildings always drew interesting people to them, uh, many of them creatives and Part of our job was to collect and interpret their stories. Um, some people listed here that we spoke with, uh, Brad Lippitz, um, who has known and sold units in the buildings throughout his entire 25 plus year career in real estate and describes them as quintessential Chicago. We met with resident and interior designer, Brian Snow, who emphasized how much he appreciates how well preserved the buildings are and that nobody's trying really to change too much what um, he thinks is already pretty perfect. Um, we visited with Rhoda Ann Miller in her superbly decorated apartment. You know, she said, you feel like you're part of everything. Um, and once you live with floor to ceiling windows, uh, you can't really go back. Uh, longtime resident architect uh, Margaret McCurry was kind enough to sit down with us for an interview uh, not long after the passing of her husband, architect Stanley Tigerman, uh, to share her deep knowledge of 90910. Um, Kathy Arslanian um, had a really wonderful um, insight uh, because she also sells in the buildings and is a resident, but also she grew up there as a child and um, shared a lot of really fascinating insights with us, including the fact that um, the Sun Deck used to have a playground for kids and that Bob Bell, AKA uh, the iconic Bozo the Clown lived there with his family when she was a little kid. Um, uh, Edward Butler was a joy to speak with. Um, he has been a doorman at 90910 for decades and loves the, loves the buildings. Um, he said, if it ain't broke, don't fix it. 
Um, architect Nick Weingarten spoke of the building's historical significance and architectural details very eloquently. Uh, we spoke to him a lot about bringing them into the 21st century and um, he, uh, his opinion was that modern technology means that you need to do some things, but of course with the sensitivity to the aesthetic of the clean modern design. Um, Trinidad Logue spoke poet poetically about the wonder and privilege of living at 9910 and the needs of the residents and uh, their continual plans of the board to improve the lived experience. And resident Stephen Winters was also very uh, generous with his time and spoke about the modular capabilities of the units because um, within the, the apartments, none of the walls are load bearing. Um, this uh, is the apartment of Brigida Peter Hans. Uh, meeting and interviewing her was a particularly special treat. Uh, Brigida studied with Mies at IIT. Uh, she met uh, by chance Myron Goldsmith at a youth hostel in Europe when she was young, and he told her about um, IIT and helped her come to Chicago from Germany to study with Mies. Um, she later uh, married Walter Peter Hans, who was a teacher of photography at the Bauhaus, and uh, she made her career at SOM working on significant buildings like the Hancock and Sears Tower. Um, her apartment, as you can see in this photo, is pristine Mies. Um, it houses a few pieces of original 1920s Berlin furniture designed both by Mies and other members of the Bauhaus uh, that Walter Peter Hans brought with him from Germany. Um, and as we spoke with her, she sat on the, her metal air conditioning unit. It's called a Marlow unit. You can see it uh, way in the back in the photo here. And we suggested switching seats, but she said, you know, architects, we only sit on stools. We're not used to having a back. And so she preferred to sit like that. Um, and we, we asked her um, what Mies was like as a teacher and Brigitte said he was very unique in that he would come and look at your project for a long time without saying anything. Um, and so you would sit there in awkward silence for 10, 15, 20 minutes without saying a word. And throughout that time, you realized everything that was wrong with your work. And so he would ask very few questions and uh, didn't say much. Um, one uh, other really interesting inquiry we made when we spoke with Brigida was about Mises' relationship to color. Um, and she shared an interesting anecdote with us that, to be honest, I became a little obsessed with. Um, she said that uh, 6880 was painted steel. And uh, because of that, they could have chosen any color for the building. And so they had this idea of maybe using yellow. So she said yellow was a really serious consideration. And uh, then they ended up with uh, paint, which was supposed to be the most durable. And so because of that practical consideration, it turned out being black. And that's why black became so fashionable uh, for Mises buildings and others of that era. Um, to clarify, everyone else we spoke with absolutely repudiated this, <laughs> but uh, I love to imagine that a set of yellow Mies buildings along the Chicago lakefront could have been possible. Um, coincidentally, the main, uh, promotional book for 86880 pictured here on the right uh, we found from 1957 actually uses yellow as its accent color. Um, it's called The Glass House, A Home for Gracious Living. Um, and it includes uh, floor plans and a lot of advertising copy reassuring prospective tenants about the safety and comfort of living in a contemporary home made of glass. Uh, the variety of interiors pictured is quite interesting. Um, it's obvious that personal taste and decor hadn't really caught up with Mies's aesthetic um, at that point. Um, we met with uh, another person who knew Mies personally and worked with him, um, his grandson, architect Dirk Lohan. Um, we couldn't resist also asking him about Mies's relationship to color, and he spoke to us about his his experience working with Mies on the National Gallery in Berlin. Um, he assumed there would be white walls onto which the art would hang um, and asked Mies how the space should be divided up for the museum exhibits. And to his uh, astonishment, um, Mies ordered primary color Shantong silk curtains, uh, red here and blue there. And you know that's what they ended up going with. And he said it looked fantastic like a Mondrian painting. Um, and Dirk said everybody thought he only liked black and white, which 
actually is not, not true at all. Um, and it's really nice to see these flexible grid systems and curtains still being used at the new National Gallery, even now, uh, like this piece by Thomas Demand, which is a meditation on contemporary Ger Germany. Um, despite touting Mises' love for color, Dirk uh, absolutely discounted even the possibility that Mies would ever have considered yellow for any building, uh, but he shared some really interesting insights on why uh, all the black. Um, Dirk said that Mies, uh, Mises' buildings in Chicago were all black because Chicago was a city where all of the heating systems were coal-fired and there was a lot of soot in the air, which the Union stockyards blew all over the city. Um, Dirk reminisced about his visit to Chicago in 57 um, and that after half a day or so in the city, your white collar would be just completely black. Um, and he said, you know, Mies observed this and decided it makes absolutely no sense to paint buildings any other color because they would turn black uh, anyhow. Um, that's why, you know, when Mies built the Farnsworth house, for example, in the country where there was no coal and soot, he painted it white. Um, another important part of our uh, research process was to canvas the buildings and photograph every observable detail inside and out. Um, from the rooftop to the garage, we surveyed and documented 909.10 with uh, close attention to the proportions, materials, forms, shadows, and any visible graphic elements, uh, both old and new. Um, our next step was to uncover any materials relevant to the buildings we could find in libraries and archives. Um, we found a great deal of materials and um, spent an entire day at the Ryerson and Burnham Library at the Art Institute um, going through one item at a time uh, that was contained in the numerous gray archival Mies boxes that were brought out to us. Uh, if you haven't uh, been there for a visit, uh, definitely check it out. It's a wonderful place. Um, uh, reviewing the newspaper articles about 910, we learned more about the planning and construction of the buildings and of two people in particular who were a big part of the building's narrative and history. Uh, one was the developer Herbert Greenwald, pictured here on the left with Mies and in the news article as well. You can always recognize him by his pipe. Uh, Greenwald and his partner Samuel Katzen um, acquired the block just north of 868.80 for what was then the highest price ever paid for residential land in Chicago. Um, completed in 57, 910, then uh, commonly referred to as the Esplanade Apartments, uh, was the first large-scale project for which Mises' office completed both the design as well as the construction documents. Uh, 9910, like 86880, was constructed on a 21 foot column grid. Uh, not by coincidence, uh, the 9910 towers are also sited 21 feet west of the west column center line of 880. Um, so, in terms of a grid, uh, the two towers also have a relationship. Um, tragically, uh, Greenwald died in an airplane crash from Midway to LaGuardia in 59, uh, only a few years after the completion of 9910. Um, another um, thing that we found in our research um, were uh, a lot of uh, indications um, about um, a lot of the uh, elements which distinguish 9910 from their predecessors, 860 and 880. Um, because 900-910 was designed five years after 860-880, in the interval, a lot of the technology had advanced and the market demands had shifted. And Mies was very eager to exploit these new technologies. Um, 900-910 was the tallest concrete building yet constructed in Chicago, the first with a flat slab concrete frame. It also boasted the city's first air cooling system, um, one of the first unitized anodized aluminum curtain walls, and Chicago's first large-scale use of tinted heat-absorbing glass. 
um, Mises student and later colleague, uh, Joseph Fujikawa, pictured here on the right of Mises in the photo, uh, was very active on the project and was responsible for many of the large and small decisions. For example, he was credited for deciding on including garbage chutes, uh, which uh, apparently Mises thought was unsanitary and left out at 86880. Um, Fujikawa was forcibly relocated to a Colorado Japanese internment camp uh, during his junior year of college and was there for months before being admitted to IIT where he received his bachelor's and master's degree in architecture. Um, his associates recalled, um, uh, funny enough, that Mr. Fujikawa wanted to be more like Mies than Mies himself. Uh, one of the most interesting finds as well at the Ryerson and Burnham Library was this printed piece showing uh, the last rebrand of 900-910 from the 70s. Uh, the design is by the Hoffman Advertising Group in New York, which uh, as far as we can tell uh, is no longer in existence. Um, the advertising copy and scale of the printed material was really impressive, but um, as you can see, the typography is quite dated and leaves much uh, to be desired. Another wonderful resource was the Chicago History Museum, uh, which houses the Hedrick Blessing Photography Archive, which contains many photographs of 900-910 in construction, um, as well as upon completion. And of course, uh, MoMA houses the Mies van der Rohe Archive, including the original ground floor plan uh, for 900-910, uh, which we also carefully studied. So, which brings us to our next section, which is our typographic research. So we're just gonna kind of walk you through a bit of our approach, um, as Sophie mentioned, which is very much based in our research. So the first questions we asked were, what is Mies typography? And what typography did Mies use? And what would Mies use now to brand these buildings? Now with Mies van der Rohe, um, there's going to be a forest of low hanging fruit that was in front of us. Um, I'm actually kind of curious if anyone wants to chime in on chat, uh, what they would consider a low hanging fruit for uh, Mies van der Rohe project, because um, there's plenty. Um, but we believe that Mies left us everything we needed for this brand. We just needed to discover it. Uh, Massimo Vignelli, who uh, considered Mies uh, his greatest mentor, served as a great inspiration uh, for us throughout this project. So we wanted to kind of take a deep dive into what could have possibly influenced uh, Mies's typographic choices. So um, we started off with um, this specimen with uh, Barron's Medieval from 1914 that was designed by Perrin, uh, Peter Barron's who was, uh, who employed Mies as an architect um, from 1908 to 1911. And then of course there is the uh, boss typography um, that is all very well documented, but we wanted to get in a little bit deeper. So we wanted to see what type they were actually using. Uh, here's a specimen sheet from a brief Magier grotesque, which is considered a predecessor to accidents grotesque which um, actually there's a digital version now by Font Font called FF Bao. Um, of course, there's the Herbert Beyer um, Universal Alphabet uh, created in 1925. And then we also found this other Venus grotesque um, that was popular with the Bauhaus also. And of course, there was the hand done uh, typography um, for a lot of the poster work. Now, when we spoke with Dirk Lohan, he was very adamant that people make a mistake of associating these too much with the Bajas. Um, he stated it was not correct. He never went to the Bajas and that he was kind of in the periphery. Um, but he really came in at the end with the last couple of years when Mies led it. And it was mostly an architecture school and it had greatly diminished from its previous uh, quarries. So that kind of put an end to looking at the Bajas uh, typography. So then we started looking at the typography that has been used at 900 and 910 since 1955. On the right, you have um, the advertisement when the buildings were under construction. So you would imagine you would see this from Lakeshore Drive as you were driving by, along with uh, looking at the blueprints um, and also uh, on the top, the 910s on the top are the original 
um, uh, window treatment for the address and the unfortunate current ones below. Um, as we canvassed the entire grounds, we took photography of all the type that we could find, including the um, uh, original lot numbers um, in the elevator on the top here, along with more uh, updated numbers outside and in the original uh, mailboxes. As Sophia uh, mentioned, you know, the, um, we came across this brochure from 1957. Um, what we were more interested in is what typography they were using, and we identified this as the typeface being 20th century. We also looked at some of the other marketing materials that were being used to sell Mises buildings at the time, um, here using Futura Bold. Um, what's interesting about these is it appears that they were selling them before they were built, since there's no actual photos of the built buildings, just the models and mock-ups. Um, and it's clearly the same uh, designer who did uh, both. And then there was an eclectic mix of um, other things that we found um, that we can possibly consider uh, as being uh, Lee's typography. We came across this book by IIT uh, about Mies van der Rohe that uh, we dismissed this as possible um, uh, style from IIT. And then there was uh, a book designed um, when the uh, apartments were converted to condos to show off Mies and 900-910 um, using uh, Helvetica in this book. The most entertaining part of this book is the um, newspaper headlines that are scanned at the bottom with such uh, uh, crazy headlines as glass houses use up loads of concrete and people who live in glass apartments throw verbal stones at scoffers. How dare they? So we asked Dirk Lohan, be like, so what was his preferred typeface? And he said that, you know, everybody in the modern movement liked Helvetica, but it was not Mies. So what was Mies? So he told us, and Mies in his office used copper plate gothic. <laughs> his name was spelled that way on the letterhead, and I wouldn't be surprised if he had already had that preference in Europe. Copper plate, Mies van der Rohe. Okay, I uh, did not see that coming. Um, so that was quite a find. And then we look back at his invoices that we saw, we found at the library, and in fact, it was copper plate and that book that we dismissed as an IIT style was also using copper plate. Um, so apparently that was his typeface of choice. So we said, okay, Mies, um, would this work for 900, 910 Lakeshore Drive? And this one um, answered that question a resounding no. Uh, we can't do anything with this one, um, damn it. So we found out what his uh, preferred typeface was. Uh, so we had to, oh, before I go on, um, what we did find was kind of interesting though, is that when we compared copper plate to uh, Peter Barron's, uh, Barron's Medieval, you know, I'll just kind of leave this here. It is rather, this does have some similarities where I wonder if this is where this overlapped. So um, at this point, we moved on to taking a couple different approaches. Um, at first, we, we had two uh, distinct approaches, one being a modernist typographic approach where we wanted to explore contemporary typographic treatments that would formally relate to the architecture of 900-910, and also a logo that was more an Amesian form in the 900-910 sense where we would be building the form out of the formal and distinguishing aspects of the buildings and of property. And we use this quote by Mies as our uh, guide throughout this entire process. Now with every project that we begin, uh, well, pretty much every branding project, uh, we start off with type studies. So we have a document, an InDesign document that has about um, 400 different typefaces and treatments um, in a grid just like this that we do a find and replace every time uh, we have a new project. So it automatically populates the InDesign doc, we print it out and we can see what our options are that we have accessible in house. Um, so while we look at this type, we look for opportunities that will represent the formal and architectural qualities. 
Here's a small example of our uh, geometric SANS uh, studies, a small example of our square humanist SANS studies, and a small sample of the modern Roman uh, studies. Now, modern Roman was kind of, um, we thought there could be a potential for an unexpected solution here with the high contrast and the elegance um, that is inherent in a lot of, um, in this type of classification. So that was something we were open to. So at this time, it was uh, summertime um, and we actually were uh, in New York um, shortly after we started this project um, to attend the Type Directors Club exhibition where we had some work being showcased. Uh, while we were at the exhibition, we were able to meet um, the uh, typeface designer Tobias Ferrer Jones. Um, while we were speaking with Tobias, um, I told him about the project and I asked him, uh, or I mentioned the question of what is Meads typography? And he was very intrigued. Um, he asked us how long we were in town for. We were in town for a few days. Um, so uh, wait till Saturday. And so he invited us to his studio in Park Slope in Brooklyn on Friday. So Friday comes along and it's one of those days in New York in the summer where it's like blazing hot and everything smells like a diaper. Um, and you're like literally drenched in sweat by the time you get to the end of your block. And that was at 8 a.m. So um, we decided to take it easy. Um, we originally had plans of going to museums. We we're like, okay, we're just gonna get some rest and get ready for this meeting with Tobias. At 10 o'clock, uh, Sophia's phone rings at the same time that we get a very angry knock on the door. Uh, it turns out we made a huge mistake on our Airbnb reservation and we had to be out now. Um, and we're like, we can't be out now. We're totally unpacked. We haven't had coffee. We're not ready to do anything. Um, and they said, okay, we'll give you an hour. So we're just at about 10.01. I had a complete meltdown uh, trying to just, we're just throwing everything into a bag. We're like, okay, we don't even know where to go. Um, you know, and it's going to take us an hour to get over there. We don't even know where we're going to go. Um, so we have to figure out what to do. So all I could think of at this point was my Irish ancestors who showed up in New York in the early 1900s, sweaty, stinking with luggage and nowhere to go. Uh, here I am 100 years later, not far better off. We did get out by 11. We did not have an address to give an Uber to, so we just made one up um, in Park Slope. And we frantically were calling my uncle who was in Park Slope to see if we could at least drop our bags off so we didn't show up looking like uh, Ellis Island. Um, and, but he was off the grid on vacation. But the heavy traffic as we had to drive through the entire island of Manhattan actually did us a favor because we were able to find a new place to stay in the traffic. And we got to Tobias's with 20 minutes uh, to spare. So uh, once we were there, uh, we spent the afternoon with Tobias and uh, Nina Strassinger. Um, and they were incredibly, incredibly generous with their time. Uh, we spent the afternoon discussing typography. And um, he showed us this typeface that he was working on. Um, the typeface was appropriately named with the temporary title of Provisorium. Uh, is a stunning, truly modern, modern Roman typeface with square geometric proportions. It has an elegant yet industrial feel. It feels very 900, 910. Um, and it was so contemporary that it wasn't even finished yet. Tobias only designed the caps and the numbers and considering the subject of our brand, uh, the numbers were really all that we needed. So we had a trial for a provisorium and we started to play with it. So now we were thinking about how we can bring back some meaning into the typography. So our first sketch here, our first layout or piece here was um, uh, rep the line is representing the covered walkway that um, connects the two buildings. So we were looking at a number of different things like lines and other elements on how to make this connection. Now we got into this argument on the line, because um, you know if we mentioned that Massimo was very much an influence here. And Massimo, one thing he is adamant about is that every mark must mean something. Um, now, but with the 900, 910 with the slash, it has more of a formal relationship with the curves in the nine. So we were kind of going back between what semantically 
accurate and what's formally ac or stronger. Um, and ultimately we went with the uh, semantically stronger. And this is how uh, we envisioned that um, this would be um, implemented. There was also um, some experimentation with uh, an ampersand as a connector, uh, as you see here. So um, when you look at the footprints of this build of these buildings, um, they resemble an island, and they sort of are because of where they're located, where you're near the lake, but you're separate from the lake, but you're near Michigan Ave, but you're separate from Michigan Ave. So, um, but what you don't see is that there's an underlying grid. Um, now, if Mies is gonna give you a grid, why would you not try to do something with the grid? So we did a number of experimentations as far as maybe creating new forms out of the grid. Um, these were just much more of studies and texture studies, which had some fun uh, results. Now, one of the most unique features of 900-910 is the sun deck. Now, if you've ever driven down Lakeshore Drive, you may have thought it was a pool, but I can assure you it is, in fact, a sun deck. Um, so uh, we also played with this idea as far as uh, bringing that into the icon. So here we have the, um, the column grid from the buildings, the rectangle representing the sun deck, and then the slash representing the angle of Lakeshore Drive going by um, the properties. Here is uh, another incarnation of that same idea. Um, I thought this kind of looked like the, a logo for a European car company that you only is only available at the airport, um, but, but it kind of had a fun <laughs> feel to it, uh, but was not appropriate. Um, and finally, here is a, um, another study that we did some impl implementation with using the column uh, grid structure along with the reverse slash acknowledging Lakeshore Drive and the use of accidents grotesque for the typography, which um, also would lead to a number of different pattern options if we wanted to do that graphically. So um, another approach we took was to look at the columns. Now, the columns are not a unique idea. The Via Tugendhat in Czechoslovakia uses a column as its logo. The uh, Barcelona Pavilion website sells a t-shirt with a Mies van der Rohe column on it. But we just kind of looked at it instead of looking straight down at the column, we looked at it straight ahead. Also looking to kind of create um, some dual meaning with the 900-910 going in opposite directions, acknowledging the two buildings. Um, there was also a little bit of experimentation early on with um, the, you know, the original name of the property was Esplanade Apartments. So we were playing with maybe making an icon with a simplified version of an E and an A, uh, as you see on the left. And there was also some um, exploration of a ampersand logo treatment that would also can have a dual meaning of the sun rising over one of um, the buildings. And of course, we looked at the curtain wall, um, which is one of the most um, iconic parts of the uh, architecture, um, with some of these type studies being inspired by that. However, none of these were working. Um, so what we decided to do at this point was kind of take a step back and look and be like, OK, what makes 900, 910 different than 800, um, I'm sorry, 860, 880. Now, obviously there's the black windows are the most immediate. So we had an early sketch here with kind of playing with the windows as a building, um, but it wasn't until we met with Margaret McCurry who mentioned that um, the windows were in fact in the golden ratio. Um, and once we substituted the rectangles for golden ratio um, uh, rectangles that resembled the windows, something very Miesian started to happen. Um, and at this point we said, okay, maybe there's something here. Now, when we started playing with these, all of a sudden these other logos for other Mies buildings started popping up like this one, which very well could be a logo for Crown Hall. Um, if anyone from IIT is here, uh, you could feel free to call us. Uh, we'd be happy to chat with you about that. 
So um, we decided on two windows because you could also see them as two buildings. So we like this dual meeting um, in the secondary uh, association. So at this point, it was time to return to typography. So, you know, the criteria we were using um, for the type, uh, the type is listed here. And we also kind of added that we would prefer if it was a German typeface, just because it has a uh, tradition of having rational typefaces and it could inherently tie back to Mies um, with uh, his heritage. And it was a bit of a no brainer. Um, I knew when we started that DIN would probably work really well. I had no idea how well it would work. I mean, if you're working off of a typeface inspired by industrial German engineering designs, you know, you have to go with what is the best. And that's what we went with here because it's legible, it's uncomplicated, it's geometric, it's unadorned, and it would work really well with our mark. And it is so German, even Eric Spiegerman says, everything can be measured in Germany with DIN. So once we added the numbers, um, it created all new problems. Um, something magical started happening where it's like, okay, these are starting to kind of look like the columns that are holding up the buildings, except you know, there's three on each side, there's four columns. Because of our extensive research of the grid, we knew before we even started, there's four columns on each short side. Um, so it would be nice if we were able to kind of keep that symbolism of the columns and mesh it with the numbers. So um, now, things we were working with was trying to put a line between the two or a space between the two. How thick is the line? Because if the line gets too thick, it could turn into a one and it would no longer be 900, 910. It would be 9,100,910 uh, as some of the ones in the bottom work, which is not going to work at all. Um, the kerning was an absolute nightmare because we have, you know, two nines, three, oh, three uh, zeros and a one. So you're always gonna have to battle around that one no matter what. Um, but we knew that if we could solve this, we could get there. So once again, we look back to Mies. I said Mies would always give us the answer and he in fact did. Uh, we came to the realization that the vertical lines and horizontal lines could meet. Um, so basically what this does is it separates the numbers, but intact makes them um, uh, unified with the mark above and allowed us to borrow the ex uh, exact window proportions to mimic the bases of the buildings. And these were the final lockups that we had um, at that point. Um, the mark also works really well with a pattern taken in and out of the um, uh, uh, background here. And here again, you see the um, how true the marks are. The mark is to the um, the windows themselves, which brings us to the brand implementation. So uh, here is the letterhead and business card. Uh, as you see, we brought the grid from the windows over to the back and the very bottom of the letterhead. You'll see the big stripe of negative space going down the middle that is to represent the space between the two buildings um, and that also carries over to the business card. We did all of the internal materials um, that they uh, needed to be designed including a Microsoft Word template um, that took some sorcery to achieve but you can in fact do uh, style sheets um, in Word if you really wanted to. Um, so we put this all together for the, um, for the client, um, including with, uh, preset type sizes. So there would be, everything would always be the utmost consistent and precise, um, as possible. We believe that the brand lives in this precision. So even the tabs that are in the Microsoft Word document or Word templates are based off of the logo down in the bottom. So as you see, the first tab goes in between the logo and then the second tab out. So we felt that this was, these sort of formal relationships, whenever possible, would always strengthen the brand since when you walk around in these building, everything starts to align. 
And one of the most important uh, components of the brand implementation uh, is, of course, the new website, uh, which tells the building story. Um, and we needed to find a partner to collaborate with on the writing and photography uh, to con convey this important and nuanced narrative. Um, we selected Ashley Lukasik and Miriam Doan of Murmuring to partner with us on writing, photography, and PR. Uh, Murmuring is a unique company specializing in immersive experiences with broad capabilities, uh, particularly when it comes to thoughtfully and beautifully telling uh, compelling stories, which is exactly what we were looking for. Um, as we neared the brand launch, uh, the pandemic hit, uh, so this added uh, many unique challenges for the photo shoots. Uh, luckily, we were able to take advantage of the beautiful sun deck outdoors um, and armed with masks, a small team and a COVID officer, we were able to capture the beauty of 900 910 and the residents were more than gracious, allowing us to photograph their homes. Uh, we were able also to get a permit for a drone, which allowed us to capture the exterior of the building things and their unique location on the lake. Um, the result was a series of photographs capturing the architecture, uh, but also the spirit of the buildings and of course their inhabitants. Um, if you're interested uh, to read more about 900.910, we highly recommend visiting the website. It's simply 900.910.com. Uh, this is the homepage, uh, which is an overview of the varied content found throughout the site. Um, the legacy page includes historical information and archival photographs of the buildings. Um, we hope in the future to add a digital archive um, where architects, researchers, and the public can access an even wider array of information and resources. Um, the Living at 900-910 page of the website um, is all about the unique resident experience. Um, it really, uh, viewing this page really makes us want to move in. Um, the resident resources uh, page um, has a beautiful photo of the lobby and uh, there's a news page which um, actually currently contains an interview conducted with us about the project. So if you're interested in learning more beyond our talk today, uh, feel free to check that out. Um, and one of the most uh, unique pages uh, of the website is um, entitled Reflections. And this is a place where residents can contribute uh, their perspective. Uh, the inaugural piece is an essay by Ar architect Margaret McCurry. Um, Margaret writes uh, very eloquently about her and her late husband, uh, Stanley Tigerman's history, uh, which is so entwined with Mies and 900-910. Um, on the right uh, in the photograph here, on this slide, uh, you can see Margaret's father presenting Mies with the AIA gold medal. Um, and another lovely aspect of this essay is the last section where she requested other residents of 900-910 to contribute their perspective. So they really re reveal what a unique and special place 900-910 uh, has always been and continues to be to this day. Um, as we reflect on this project, we can say with confidence it's been one of the most profound and rewarding creative experiences we've been a part of, and uh, we just want to thank the board, the architecture committee, and all the residents for uh, trusting us with this project. Um, thank you very much, and uh, we'd love to hear your uh, thoughts and questions. Thank you so much. That was such a inspiring presentation. Um, the office that I work out of um, pre-COVID pre is actually a Mies Van Roo building. So hearing you guys talk about a lot of the research that you know went into the building um, really resonates. Um, I do have one question. Um, it seems like a lot of the research that was done was based on studying the history of everything around the building, the design architecture, and obviously Mies. Um, at any point, did the two of you do any research outside of, you know, the building? Um, just curious about that. Um, well, not really. I mean, we did look at the brands of um, some different, mostly in the web, um, you know, like the Via Tugan Hut and the Barcelona Pavilion, along with, um, you know, Farnsworth House and some others. But the thing is with Mies is it's really easy to go on a tangent. Mm -hmm. And, you know, once you go in, you just, it's like a rabbit hole. You know, we could spend 30 minutes talking about uh, 
Edith Farnsworth's dogs. I mean, you know, like it could go in any number of directions. So we were really weary of that and staying focused on 900, 910. And the thing is, you know, if we had done this for 800 or 860, 880, this would have been really easy. You know, every book, B's book has a chapter on those and there was nothing written about this. You know, like there's a little paragraph here and there's a little this here and like we really had a dig. So, um, you know, we just really tried to stay as focused as we could on, um, you know, just uncovering the story of these buildings that had been overlooked for so very long. Yeah, I'm asking because it, it, it's such a timeless identity and it fits perfectly with the building. Um, which obviously shows in the presentation that the two of you just gave. Um, I know we're almost at time, but I'm open to, I don't know, Dan, Sophia, if you're able to stay a few minutes over, um, but if anyone else has any questions, uh, feel free to unmute. Yeah, we'll stay as long as uh, people have questions. I had a quick question about the time frame from beginning to end. Uh, we worked on the project um, for over a year. Yeah, I'd um, say about 15 months. 15 total. months yeah, or 16, so. Yeah. Um, and we still, um, because of uh, COVID, we prioritized the website. Um, so um, in 2021, uh, we have plans to um, continue implementation. Um, but in terms of what we were able to accomplish is um, some of the internal materials we showed the website and the brand identity. So it was um, almost almost a year and a half. Thank you. And, and how big was the team that worked on it? The branding team, uh, you're looking at it. Um, and then uh, <laughs> you know, we brought in um, murmuring to help us this is what we typically do is we'll bring in photographers or writers or um different contractors depending on the project that we need um but you know all the uh branding work came from uh the two of us thank you so i've got a question about the process uh and you know the output uh that is part of the completion of this project, uh, given the amount of um, research and discovery that was required for you to do the project, are you planning on publishing any of this or publishing the results of the research and synthesis uh, or even, you know, like the type studies, like, uh, you know, the findings either from a historical perspective or from you know a design perspective um we we would absolutely be interested in that we've had some initial discussions we we are very fresh from finishing some of the implementation aspects so i think we haven't gotten to the point of you know actually collecting all the materials and finding you know, where they belong. Um, you know, something that we have um, discussed with the client is um, creating a more full archive that lives on the website that can contain a lot of the research materials that we found. Um, that would be more as like a resource for the public, but regarding, you know, publishing a case study or a book um, on our process and the design work, um, I think something that we uh, began to discuss is perhaps perhaps um, applying for a grant um, from the Graham Foundation or other organizations that work uh, to fund projects like that for designers, um, uh, particularly when it relates to architecture as well, because I think we have uh, actually pulled out here some of our initial research finders. This is just <laughs> one of the few. Here's me. So, you know, we just have we have a, a lot of material, a lot of research, and you know, I think it. I think it would be a wonderful project once we're kind of uh, on the other side of the brand implementation to, um, you know, c consider doing something like that. Absolutely. Yeah, I think that would be. I mean, great. And but at the same time, it's like you know, aside from the project, that's its own project, right? <laughs> Absolutely. Um, I do have. I do have a one last question for the two of you. Um, what was the interaction with the client like? Um, did they enjoy? I mean, just what was that like? The relationship there. 
It was very unique. Um, what was really wonderful is um, I think I think Trinidad's with us um, listening today. Uh, we worked uh, very closely with a small committee that was that is part of a larger board, and so the president of the board, Trinidad Logue, uh, worked with us most directly. Um, and uh, there are uh, three other people um, on the board. Um, and uh, uh, on this architecture committee. And so what was really wonderful is their love for the buildings, understanding of the buildings and dedication to making this happen. And so it was a small, a small group of people that we, um, that we presented to and had communications with um, who um, were equally um, invested in really uh, raising the bar um, of the design of the buildings um, to uh, measure up, you know, really to the architecture. Um, and I think it's it, it's very rare um, for um, a clients to be so collaborative and available and interested and committed to following such a lengthy research process and really doing this right. Um, and they really allowed us to follow our process and, um, and um, allowed um, everything to unfold naturally and allowed us the time really to, to um, do all of these investigations and to really do it right. And I think uh, that uh, for that, we were you know, very, very grateful. Um, and I think um, the, the final result is uh, really a testament to um, also their, their dedication to this, to the process. Yeah, and I think, um, you know, it's the thing with, also with me is, is that he invokes very strong opinions. And um, even if you don't live in a Mies building, um, he, he can, he has the ability of doing that. And so the people that do live there, you know, they live there by choice. Um, they. Uh, overlook a lot of things as far as the bells and whistles of amenities of newer buildings because they want to live in this thoughtfully designed place. Um, so what was really important for us to do because of that is to stay as objective as possible and to be focused on, you know, the brand has to be true to the buildings, not to me as a person or some subjective preferences that it has to, it has to be true to 900, 910. And um, when we were able to, you know, put the work forward like that and explain the thought that was behind it, you know, that is what was able to make, you know, I think the collaboration with the committee and with Trinidad uh, really special because they saw that also because someone had to be objective about it and almost kind of a referee, you know, getting through this um, because um, there's just so many different tangents, as I said, you could go on and strong personalities and strong, uh, feelings that, you know, there's a bit of navigating, um, uh, as with any project, but specifically with something as uh, passionate as some East building. Um, one thing that I thought was really interesting about this talk was I was seeing again and again how you guys really utilized chance encounters and like little things that came up or whoever you met who knew this person and, you know, who created this new typeface and things like that. And and also it seemed like you even utilized when you felt stuck, like when you hit a creative block, you kind of flipped it. And I was wondering if you had any advice about how to go about those things, those hard times that we come across in design and like when, how to be aware and utilize these chance encounters. I know that's a very like kind of woo woo question, but. <laughs> I think, um... You know, what's nice about our close collaboration is that, um, you know, I don't think we, we believe in kind of being stuck. I think you, you work through that, you just continue on, um, you know, you uh, change your perspective. Um, but I, I think what's really great about our collaboration is that we typically work separately and then at some times, um, Come, come back together and review each other's work. And so I see things in Dan's sketches that I began to experiment with and the other way around. And so it 
I can we both constantly have an outside perspective. And so that kind of uh, going apart and coming together as a collaborative process allows us to kind of um, allow each one of us who might be frustrated or stuck to get unstuck um, in the term that you're using. So I think that uh, process really helps, but also, um, you know, uh, going back to research, um, you know, we're both um, educators as well. We teach design. And so I think um, that experience and perspective also allows us to have insight into um, different processes and techniques that we can use, um, just practically speaking, to um, kind of get ourselves out of a rut as well. Yeah, and I think it also has to do with just having, you know, reasonable expectations of your work. Um, you know, if you're, you know, our approach with being research-based and trying to find meaning, you know, through this research instead of looking at other designers or trends or things of that sort, which would lead, lead to a shallow design that could have worked for somebody else because they had done it themselves. But, um, you know, if you have, uh, reasonable expectations as opposed to like, I'm going to do the greatest logo ever, you know, like to be like, you're probably not, um, you know, and even um, one of actually a few of my students on here, they'll know this quote, um, Paul Rand used to like the sub quote me and say, don't try to be original, just try to be good. And I think that's really, you know, if you just make good work, you know, the clients are going to be pleased as opposed to trying to create something, you know, original, which is incredibly difficult. Um, if you start off seeking originality. That makes a lot of sense, thank you. I don't know how many more questions you're gonna allow us to ask, but since you were talking about clients and being educators, I'm curious as to whether you think that your educational expertise makes it easier for you to communicate with clients or if that is like a completely separate piece that's like design business. Does that make sense? Yeah. Um, I think it helps with clients because you are used to explaining things. Um, and, uh, you know, particularly, um, you know, it's uh, teaching at schools that have, you know, a number, you know, where students come from diverse backgrounds and different languages and so forth where, you know, just from our teaching approach, we try to be as visual as possible, um, not relying on um, things to be remembered just because you said them. Um, so that's something as far as kind of, okay, but the students, you know, you even have to, I think, take an extra step with the clients um, that the students wouldn't necessarily need because they already have some uh, design uh, education background to kind of imply where you're heading, where the client may in fact take it much more um, uh, in a pragmatic sense and could misread what you're presenting if uh, it's not presented in the right way. Great. You know, don't ever assume they know. Oh, what thank you. <laughs> I, uh, I have one more question. Um, just for fun. So sometimes I think, I'm sorry, I've got Mickey's in the background here playing Legos. Um, but uh, sometimes I think, you know, like our creative work happens at really some of our most important, some of the most important projects that we work on creatively happen at times when we're also going through a sort of metamorphosis of sorts in a personal level. Um, and I know that you both have some exciting news that's happening for you um, pretty soon. So I wondered if you like had any thoughts on that. And this has been this like crazy year with this really important, you know, career project um, as a husband and wife team during COVID um, with also this other big thing happening. I just wondered if, if you had anything to say about that. <laughs> yeah, so for, so for those of you who don't know us, um, I'm, I'm, we're expecting a baby next month. Uh, in January, so we're having a little girl. So definitely, uh, this uh, has been a very productive year, <laughs> to say the least. Um. Yeah. So um, yeah, it's just an exciting time, uh, to say the least. Um, so. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I, I think uh, this is our last, or my last big commitment. This talk until 
probably March or April. Uh, so, you know, actually in terms of timing um, and us teaching the semester and this project, I mean, I think it's been, um, you know, because uh, we're husband and wife and also uh, partners in design and we uh, teach at the same university, um, it's been, uh, you know, a lot of time together, but I'm sure as everybody has kind of learned during this uh, strange uh, COVID experience of ours, um, it's really um, put things in perspective. And I think in many ways allowed us to um, focus on the brand implementation and the research um, really closely and collaborate in even more of a close way than um, we would have, if, you know, with your typical uh, life uh, distractions. So it's been um, it's it's been interesting, and you know, we're uh, the client. We were. Uh, uh, joking, because uh, she'll, uh, I'm going to deliver at Northwestern Hospital, and it's across the street from 900, 910, so we're going to bring her over for a visit uh, <laughs> immediately after. <laughs> Congratulations, and I know um, given the, the pandemic, uh, at some point I hope there is a, a brand launch party, hopefully 2021 or something. Um, um, yes, yeah, so if there's a book also, let me know. I will definitely get that book. <laughs> um, great. So I know we're way past time. Um, if anyone else doesn't have questions, I just want to, you know, once again, a uh, special thank you to both you, Dan and Sophia, and everyone else that was able to make it. Um, if anyone doesn't have any questions, then I guess we could just call it a wrap. Um, I will be uploading this talk to YouTube. So if anyone wants to share this with any friends, uh, you're more than welcome to, and I'll be posting that on the social media. Great. Um, thank you so much for being here, Dan and Sophia. We really appreciate it. And um, yeah, anyone who wants to go to our future events, uh, we are also on Eventbrite, so check us out there, and then you'll get a notification when the event comes up. Cool. Thank you so much, everyone, for being here. Um, thank you, Christian, Angela, and um, Ashley for making this happen. Um, you know, and thank you for everyone who took the time to listen to us. We really appreciate it and wish all of you a happy and safe holiday season. And hopefully we'll see a lot of you in person soon. Cool. All right. Thank see you. Thank you all. Everyone. Thank Thanks. you. Thanks, Sophia. Thank you, Angela. Thank you, Christian. Thank you, Jonathan. Thank you, Jonathan. <laughs> <laughs>